Hey budding lawyers, welcome to the podcast. Today we have with us Mr. Namit Oberoi. Hi Namit. Hi Prasanna, how are you doing? Great, great, great. And I always love to talk to young lawyers and especially who are into startups and like entrepreneurs and all. So you are one of them. I'll obviously enjoy this conversation and hope you will. Looking also. forward to it. Yeah. Namit is a lawyer from Mumbai and the founder of Sidebar Communications and also Indian Legal Tech. which is a independent online publication covering the emerging legal tech market in india so namit firstly please tell us about both of your ventures like sidebar communications and indian legal tech sure prasanna so sidebar sidebar is a communications firm i founded in 2019 after leaving legal practice so i was working as a lawyer before in mumbai and uh, what sidebar does is that it's a business development firm it works in the legal profession so it works with lawyers it works with law firms and helps them grow their practices through communications so these what i mean by that is digital communications branding communications marketing communications but we we there are different ways of raising business what we specialize in is doing that through communications okay so basically what we can say is uh, you help a lawyer brand themselves like help them in their branding correct that's a part of it i can give you examples of how it extends the branding realm for example when it comes to i work with lawyers a lot when it comes to the way in which they deliver their services so even though this is not communications to acquire new clients and it is communications with respect to retaining their clients for a longer period of time increasing their lifetime value that comes within the ambit of communications so for instance as i think you will know and your audience will know as well as lawyers we we tend to the way in which we tend to deliver our services to the client we don't often think about how the clients are actually going to use that information it's not always very usable and that does uh, affect the amount of time it does affect the happiness of the client it does affect the churn and it's quite likely that if the problem doesn't get solved until the end they don't come back so so branding is a major part of it we have a major emphasis on branding we have a major emphasis on marketing marketing gets a bad rep out in the world but uh it's just talking it's just conversation so that's the focus on how to interact in the market uh, how to how as a lawyer you should interact in the wider world outside your small bubble of network of lawyers and have conversations which lead to your personal growth as well as your business growth can you share any of the recent work related to your client which you are working on definitely definitely so so one of the one of the major i'll i'll give you two examples one of the one of the very interesting case uh, things that we are working on is uh a professional service firm which has been operating the way all law firms or legal practices have been operating for some time uh, a client comes to you uh, hi we need we need a quote this this is a service and uh, can you tell us what your service will you know they would come for an advice first and if they like it then they would come back and they would say hey we need a quote for this and you would need to to proceed and then the work starts and everything more or less happens for a small law firm it happens over whatsapp it happens over email it happens over calls hmm. if you look outside in other industries they have moved far ahead there would probably be an online portal there probably be a mobile app you're able to log in you're able to see all your documents in one place you don't have to get back to your lawyer and ask them again and again hey i can't find the uh, the, the the petition file last year uh can you please ask somebody in your office to email it to me oh I, i'm not able to can you ask your court clerk to do that that's a that's a extremely unorganized and inefficient way of working yeah because you're able to you're able to communicate a lot better by just building a small uh, a portal and giving the client the power to use whatever they need whenever they need it so one of the cases uh one of the things that we have done now one of the projects that we have worked on is we have positioned a professional service firm to become a productized online uh service where the clients are able to pay online they're able to chat with the team online etc another case is that we are currently working on is um 
is giving easier access to contracts to people who can't afford to go to a lawyer. And this becomes a very interesting business model for lawyers and law firms, because as lawyers, you're trading time. Mm. That's not a very scalable strategy. You can't spend your entire life just, stay, just trading time. Hey, here's my time. It costs 10,000 rupees an hour. Give me back 10,000 rupees. Give, give me 10,000 rupees. That's not a good strategy. So for them, we are making legal products, which are contracts and creating a library and then providing a subscription service to answer any questions they may have. So, but apart from that, we have the, the usual branding and communication firm uh, engagements as well, like social media management, like websites, like in jurisdictions, not in India, but outside where ads are common, we run ads as well. So yeah, that's, that's about sidebar. I think uh, uh, there are many firms which are focused on one product, like there are uh, client management systems, softwares. These uh, startups are upcoming now. Not much lawyers are using it, I guess. Uh, at least not uh, individual uh, firms may be using it. Yes, uh, firms are their main client. Uh, but other uh, lawyers who are uh, building their individual practice are not using much of these products. So I guess you are not focused on one product. You uh, listen to the client and you understand their problem and then suggest them the product they need, right? De definitely, definitely. It's, it, see, actually, I'm very product agnostic. I don't care what product is out there in the market because if you have that in your mind, then you're not able to provide an objective solution. Then you're just, you might as well sell products on behalf of other people. Hmm that's that's uh that's going the other way so the ideal way sidebar is a service-based company it's a service company and it's a it's a consulting company it's an advisory company so oh, we see a problem a lawyer comes and a lawyer says another example hey man i the the issue i have is i'm very good at what i do but i have to keep doing the same things again and again and i hate it hmm. And it's making me sad. It's making me not very motivated. And I have to do the same, the same stuff. I have to take out the cause list. I have to mark this in so-and-so format that we have. I have to come back from a court case. Then I have to send a report. Is there a way that I can, you know, just get to the work that I like doing? So for me, at this point, it's not good to start with a product and then slap that on that person. Mm. The idea is to really dig down and understand what is the motivation? Where is that person trying to go? And how can I provide a solution that, you know, how, how I put it, my primary goal is to improve their quality of life. Mm -hmm. and improving how their practice functions is a part of improving their quality of life. Yeah. I mean, uh, technology is one thing which I, I think in this field, lawyers are not using much with, and as they must use. Uh, I think I have even made some videos regarding it. Uh, for example, I've seen e even today lawyers, especially in lower courts, magistrate and district courts, they still carry huge files, huge uh, like diaries in which they take down dates and all, which can be replaced easily with a software and a mobile. <laughs> so this is something very interesting. You are doing it. I just love it. Mm, thank you. Thanks, Prasanna. Okay. Uh, you used to be a arbitration lawyer uh, and worked on some big noteworthy cases so can you tell me about why you left the legal practice mm, that's a that's a question i get a lot and that's a question that in the starting used to bother me a lot it, because uh because out out there in the world when a lawyer decides to leave legal practice the assumption or the insinuation almost always is you were not good enough to be a lawyer and that's why you couldn't cope with, with that. And uh, which is why you had to find a different way. My, the, the reason why I decided to leave legal practice was, I think the decision I am, it's one of the decisions I'm most proud of. There were two reasons primarily why I did that. One, I think, I think I was good at law, but I realized that that's not reason enough for me to stick to that career because you can be good at a lot of things. And secondly, just because you've studied to be a lawyer doesn't mean the skills that you've acquired to be a lawyer, you can't apply better in different settings. So 
with this orientation, I started to become a bit more self-aware about the fact that, hey, just because I've been in this industry for, for some time, it doesn't mean it's, it's better for me to experiment. Like this was, this was, I think, three or four years after graduating from law school. I thought this is a time for me to experiment. If I don't do that now, if I do that at 32, good luck. So it came down to two reasons. One, I was more interested in business than practice. We see practice of law. We see what lawyers do as a, it's a very small part of the legal services industry. If you, if like, for example, if you, if you imagine a law firm as a company, hmm. any company has different departments. Yeah. It has a production department where you're manufacturing your products. Hmm. It has a business development. It has training. It has, you know, you'd be focusing on long-term growth. Those are aspects that as, as lawyers, because we've only been trained to uh, apply the law and provide solutions, we forget the fact that it is part of a larger ecosystem. And uh, that also explains why a lot of associates, when they graduate to partner level, they face so many issues because they don't understand the context. They think that I've done my job really well, but that's not the job. That's not what it means to be a partner. So that was, that was reason number one. When I was, I was in practice, I found myself asking a lot of questions, either to my partner or to other associates or to my friends about the business side of things. The second one was pure and simple. It was differentiation. I don't like competition. And I don't think, I don't know any market in the world which is more overcrowded than India's legal prof profession. Everybody, we have, we have thousands and tens of thousands of law students churning out, you know, it's a factory is churning out and putting people in the marketplace. Lawyers before in the industry are anyway trying to find their sweet spot where they are different. And almost all of them are trying to go after the same kinds of problems. That's not a world where I wanted to be. So and less people are uh, uh, innovating and yeah. Yeah. I mean, if. It's, it's one thing to be, it's one thing to be innovative. It's another thing to just think about economics, just think about demand and supply. If there are currently, let's say there are, there are around 30 lakh lawyers in India and lawyers are smart, capable people. Most lawyers I meet are very smart people. If my reasoning was I've got one life to live, the chances that I will get another life are zero. Why do I want to spend my life solving problems, which a lot of other people can solve? maybe better than me and compete in the race of who can solve those problems better. I might as well go after problems which need to be solved in our society anyway, but nobody's paying attention to them. So there were those two reasons, I think, interest and differentiation. Especially when you have other skills which can solve other problems too. True, true, hmm. true, most definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, those reasons are quite familiar to me because I have been in that phase uh, somewhat. <laughs> anyway, you mentioned differentiation just now. So uh, why is it differentiation so important to you? Uh, can't you differentiate yourself by specializing as a lawyer itself? Hmm. Well, you can. You most certainly can. You can. You can specialize and you can differentiate in any industry. You can. You can differentiate yourself as a plumber. That's fine. Hmm. But what what it comes down to is if i see the larger context it's see it's it's strategic as well as tactical if i am just looking at pure hard numbers if let's say i've specialized in law then i've specialized in arbitration then i've specialized in investment arbitration then i've specialized in a certain kind of argument to an extent that the entire world knows that listen if there is a sovereign immunity argument there is to be run. This is the person you go to. That kind of differentiation is good. Being an arbitration lawyer is not good enough for differentiation for me because there are a lot of them and a lot of good ones. So differentiation, I feel, is you, you need to look at white spaces. You need to look at where people are not solving problems and the problems need to be solved. There are long-term consequences of solving those problems. For example, for me, I just flipped the coin, right? Instead of competing with 30 lakh lawyers, I started, I started talking to lawyers that they're my market. Immediately, the whole thing shifts. 
So differentiation is so important to me because differentiation is a way to design a life. It's the way to design a career. It's the way to design a business. And if, if uh, you know, like it helps you get seen, it helps you be authentic. It helps you be, if, if you are just being yourself, then you are different enough from the rest, rest of the people. So it also helps you in aligning with your true beliefs, with your honest beliefs. So for example, let's say I decided to differentiate myself just by being myself. There's no person in the world who can compete with me on being myself. I'm the best at that, right? So, so differentiation as a philosophy is something that I really, uh, you know, admire, I practice. And um, yeah, yeah. I think it makes sense strategically as well as, you know, in your day-to-day -day life, it does show some results. Hmm. Got it. Uh, last week itself, uh, you had told me that you had a new employee. So it's very important uh, that you choose the correct people who will be working for the company. So what do you see when you hire someone? And how many people do you have in your company? So we have, we have five people in our company, including myself. Hmm. So it's a small company. It's, it's, it's under two years, uh, less than two years old. And yeah, like the, the idea is to keep a small team. I think the idea is to keep a low maintenance team and be very conscious about who we hire. And the, the kind of people I look for are, I can, I, can, I can count three or four traits. I think that's uh, sort of the baseline for me. One, I need to hire believers, which means I, I do a lot of work in trying to communicate what we are trying to do what our end game is, what our goal is, how are we keeping our clients happy? So all of these values, I try to be very communicative about that. So then there can be two kinds of people, people who either respond or people who don't respond. If you're responding and let's say you disagree with it, that's fine. At least you're listening. So the first, first trait that I really look for are believers because these are the people who, you know, it makes sense to invest a lot of your time and effort in training them. Then there's also adaptability, agility. Like for instance, a lot of a lot of people may not are not very adaptable. Hey, this is what I do, and uh, if you need to get this done, I'll do it. Otherwise, please go about your business. Don't disturb me. That that's not something I I think in especially in a startup, especially in a small business, your team needs to be composed of people. You know, as Bruce Lee says, you're able to flow like water. So you need to be able to go into different, Flexi different places. Flexibility was the word which was in my mind when you said this. Like, and you Absolutely. gave that water example. So perfect. Absolutely. There's also one, one more thing I, I notice a lot, which is um, I don't like, I, I, I really like people who are self-motivated. And I don't like people who need to be, need to be motivated every day. Hmm. Mm hmm. If you need to give them a lecture every morning about how to get your life together or, or every week, so on and so forth, I think those are bad signs. So I try and look for to hire people who can motivate themselves. So at the start, uh, you have to bootstrap. Uh, you have to invest at least some of your hard-earned money uh, on your idea, uh, which may or may not work, which is a big risk. And you may get some investors too, but you may. How uh, did you do that for Sidebar? Hmm. Well, see, after, after I left practice, I was, uh, I was back to zero, right? Because I wasn't applying, uh, I wasn't applying the law. I was applying my intelligence about how lawyers are, what they think, how they behave, etc. But when it comes to, when it comes to, it was like starting a career all over again for me. So you're back to zero. And your savings, whatever you would have saved till that time, it's bound to get depleted. So by the time I started Sidebar, I was, I was quite worried about how I will be able to pull through, you know, if I'll run out of money and I'll, I, I would get a lot of doubts externally that, hey, it's time to get a different, okay, if you've decided to change careers, go get a job there, go get a job there, etc. So there was a lot of resistance in, in my in, in my kind of company, investments don't usually work. It's a service-based company. 
so investors was not something that i was looking after uh, out at all i started i started sidebar with a loan i started sidebar with a loan from my father who gave me enough working capital to be able to sustain the business for about 5 to 6 months then when the 6 months started to run out and the company hadn't like you know gone off the ground i did start to you know like one thing led to another i got one client and then i i was trying to make sure that client is happy then got another one and it was really after the first year that the company became financially stable the your company was profitable before 6 months too or no no it wasn't the the first year we closed it was it was profitable but there was barely enough profits because in a in a service based company it's not that hard to make a profit but so you know like how in a in a tech startup for example you would shoot at profitability maybe 5 to 6 years down the line we will be profitable that's not usually the case with service based businesses but yeah first first year was very difficult financially speaking it was very difficult and you were also building your team and also uh, your energy and everything was uh, invested in that too so uh, i understand how difficult it was okay so uh, one thing which comes to my mind about like startups is like very common thing is about the idea the startup idea as it is called so coming up with these ideas uh, is not that tough is what i feel uh, you can identify a problem and then you have to just find a solution to it uh, which you can make it profitable it but what's more important is making it profitable so finding a revenue model for it uh, what's the revenue model for your venture right now and how did you like figure it out see sidebar is sidebar is pure and simple we are uh, we provide services these are fixed fee projects so these are projects that will go on for four or five or six months or longer or these would be subscription based services for example we have a we have a graphic design subscription service that's coming up i think we should be launching it in the next two weeks so it's a what we're trying to do is we're trying to productize our services so for instance there's a law firm nobody knows graphic design inside the law firm they try and look for freelancers outside uh etc doesn't work because it's not easy to get work done through a freelancer you need to know a little bit yourself so we are moving towards a subscription based model now uh, that there's a certain amount per month you get unlimited graphic design as you want like you just make sure the one designer that we give you you don't that person is working on one thing at a time so so far it's been highly custom that's served us well so far but now it's time for us to move to a different one so what we're trying to do is uh, make subscription based services and also expand to outside india so so far we were only looking at uh, indian law firms and professional services sector moving forward the idea is to be completely global jurisdiction agnostic as to say <laughs> yeah sounds good so uh, where do you have your clients right now like your presence is in few states or in few cities only currently or you have started spreading in many more cities we are a remote firm hmm. and at any given time we are our capacity at the moment is that we cannot service more than 6 to 7 clients and those clients are come from we have only served clients either from outside india a few of them or mumbai delhi bangalore so it's not it's not ideal two things are not ideal one that we are only able to take six or seven clients at a time and two our, our spread our market it's too concentrated at the moment i i think that there's a lot more maturity in uh lawyers and law firm owners outside india so it may be easier to work with them that's that's what i found yeah okay yeah so we just uh, skipped indian legal tech thing <laughs> so a year ago you started this blog named indian legal tech uh what is it about and what was the idea behind it behind starting such a blog so i i started in indian legal tech in 2019 and the idea was to the idea was basically to scratch my own itch the idea was to solve my own problem when i was when i was practicing and i told you earlier that i started to get interested on the business side of things technology was one very fascinating aspect that i as 
as a user of technology was you know very interested in so what i started to do was i started to read a lot and all these sorts of ideas about how i could use this tool or how i could use just if you even forget technology how can i use a process or how can i use a routine to make this more effective and then i can hire somebody to be able to do that routine so that i am out there getting clients example or servicing or keeping my clients happy the idea came from there that when i started to look at look for reading material or some learning material in indian the indian geography there was nothing out there so so it's it's interesting because my the idea behind that wasn't that hey i will start a blog and one day it will you know people will say this people orientation towards people was not really a concern the idea was hey i'm learning all of this new stuff the best way for you to learn stuff is by writing stuff because according to me writing is thinking and if i'm writing in my journal i might as well write it on a blog so that others can see so it was a very it was not a you know it started as a very hobby sort of an idea like if it, it was a hobby and then uh that's that's how it is at the moment so what what it does what it covers and what i write about is how uh like i was saying how lawyers can improve their productivity their profitability the quality of life by using technology and also guiding them on how exactly that that might happen because a lot of lawyers right now the conversations you would see uh you would observe that the conversations they have are what do you think about technology what do you think about artificial intelligence what do you think is going to happen if this artificial intelligence tool can write like lawyers will they replace us these ideas are very esoteric they're not very real world ideas these are not ideas that you can you know that's philosophy so i am trying to make it a little more more actionable the example i was giving you of a lawyer earlier who said hey how can i make my day better how can i remove the all of these parts so yeah yeah that that was the idea behind in the legal tech yeah so let's get into legal tech more here so can you explain more, like talk about more what is this legal tech field because this is an emerging field especially in india uh, and uh, Um, there are many startups working in this field uh, i have seen some startup where they you they are using ai to make contracts and lot of stuff so can you just give some um, examples like the the products which are already available and very helpful to lawyers and talk more about legal tech yeah yeah most certainly legal legal tech sector should be seen the same way as we see health tech ed tech med tech uh etc these are fintech techno- fintech so these hmm. these are industries these are sectors which have which are developing off the back of a main industry which in our case is the legal industry and which should explain what legal tech is it's the idea of using technology to enhance an already existing industry i'm 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 being broad enough in my definition so as not to only include technology which is, which is useful for lawyers yeah because lawyers i don't think that lawyers are the primary market or the primary focus of the legal tech sector it's the legal consumer yeah how do we make sure so how to use technology to improve how we provide legal services how we consume legal services how we how we um for example in the justice system how do we make sure there's some sort of technologies which can you know like 9 80% of the activities in the justice system are redundant we can get away with them right so with with a little bit of careful planning so so legal tech as a sector has lot of different focuses it has access to justice it has a uh, tech inside law firms or uh, justice tech like uh, i was i was just mentioning uh in in enterprise and in companies and in house uh settings as well there are a bunch of tools so for example if you're looking at let's say uh in a lawyer's life in a lawyer's life then it's contract management contract automation document assembly for example am i able to fill a simple form a contract is 
in a contract, you've taken a certain amount of information and you've put that together cohesively to create a final document, right? So is there an easier process somewhere down the line where I can, you can equip me enough so that I can just fill a form and you can assemble a document for me on that basis, because I might save a lot of money and mm -hmm. I might also be involved. And similarly, in, uh, there are practice management solutions. There are case management solutions. How do you make sure you, you automate routine processes one task at a time? And so that ultimately, ultimately for a lawyer, speaking from a lawyer's perspective, the goal is how do I use process and technology to routinize most of the work that I find myself in, which we often call drudgery. The drudgery is for technology and the lawyer should try and free himself or herself for more strategic advisory related work where you're able to think, apply your mind, and then set a machine in place to be able to get the result you want. Okay. What kind of lawyers uh, find themselves most attracted to legal tech? Lawyers who are curious individuals, highly curious individuals. They're pro productivity geeks, like using yeah. a lot of tools, use a lot of tools in their in their personal life. They might use a lot of social media in their lives and people who are able to change, people who basically don't resist change, they're agnostic towards change. Those are people who are, you know, who do, in my experience, who often tend to find legal tech more fascinating or they're more drawn to legal tech as compared to somebody who doesn't see any reason to change or who sees change as an unnecessary ordeal. So, like, yeah, like, 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 for example, for example, if you think about just marketing, for instance, 70, 80% of the, of the lawyers or legal services, they don't, they, I don't think they're fully adapted to our current world, which is, Hey, digital is how we talk. So even today you will find lawyers who will say, nahi, hamari marketing chai pe chalti hai. <laughs> so the, the chai marketing can work only if the rest of the world is also having chai. They're having chai at Clubhouse or LinkedIn, right? So yeah. I, I also find a lot of lawyers who, are, who have their own practices are more drawn towards legal tech. Lawyers who are employed somewhere, they often don't see a reason to invest time into legal tech. They don't find that very fascinating. So how can lawyers use technology to improve their practice? Uh, you can answer it uh, using some example, like a lawyer practicing a particular specialization. So let's say, let's say you had spoken about a contract automation tool earlier, right? Mm -hmm. And if, if you think of how exactly uh, uh, in status quo, in the current system, a lawyer is, a client comes to a lawyer, let's say it's heavy document. Let's say it's construction. It's a construction contract. Uh, you come to a law firm. Uh, it creates all of your documentation, hands it over to you. You pay the money. Business is over. For a law firm, the mindset should not be that, hey, I have done this now. If there is any new documentation, the client will come to me. Or if there is a dispute, then the client will come to me. There is somewhere in the middle that a contract automation tool can help you provide a service which helps you make sure that you maintain the contract exactly the way it is intended to be. For example, if it's a large uh, contract, what happens after the lawyer is gone? The client will be, will be carrying out or changing their operations to make sure that the terms of the contract are met. The, hey, we shouldn't screw up here. Hey, this is supposed to be, we're supposed to provide a, a, a monthly progress report let's say what happens if that doesn't happen, right? So all the things that you would be seeing in a dispute later, that, hey, this was a critical path, this wasn't met, which is why these damages, if there is a law firm which is helping you, a law firm can just provide a subscription. Yeah. That, hey, you, you've, paid, you've paid eight lakhs for this scope of work to us. Here's a service of 20,000 rupees per month. And they can use a tool to flag issues like, for example, you haven't done this, which is why you can't proceed with this. It can all be automated. And the law firm can build its service, a service on top of that and say, hey, this is an auto payment, 
20,000 rupees a month you need to pay us and we will flag any time you're making a mistake so that you don't make a mistake. The, so based on software, you're able to handle a lot more services, which also goes back to differentiation. These are services which your competitors are not offering. Right. Yeah, India is very, uh, I mean, way behind other countries in the legal tech sector, especially. So there are many reasons for that. Uh, can you point out something, some reasons? What do you think? And is it going to change soon? Mm. I, th I think the main, there are two main important reasons and they may not be what you think. Number one is how is regulation, how our industry is regulated and a related reason to that is uh, culture. The, the legal, I'll start with the second one first. The culture of doing different things, it's not really in the DNA of a lawyer because that by itself flags risk. So for instance, in our regulation on how lawyers are governed, you get flagged, you get flagged for, for example, for example, I, I, I know somebody who had told me that, hey, I had my website up and I had put a picture of myself on the website and the bar council sent me a notice. And then I said, listen, you go and resist bar council and tell bar council to wake up. It's 2020, <laughs> right? That I can obviously I can put up my picture or I should be able to if I'm not able to then there needs to be a dialogue about it whether in the court or otherwise but because this this culture has been there with us for about 100 150 years that's why we are usually we resist change and I think that's the problem if you're resisting change then you're resisting future and nobody wins against the future you don't win against the future so that's uh I think the number one reason is regulation because, for example, let's say if, uh, you know, all these legal marketing, legal marketplace companies that have come up, that there's a website, you go, you find a lawyer over there, right? Uh, or, for example, a lot of companies which are selling business and corporation services, trademarks, etc. You would have seen a lot of them. Yeah. A, a few of the companies, I think it was last year that they had, I think there was a case filed against some of them in Allahabad High Court. And that, hey, this is unauthorized practice of law, etc. So what it tends to do is that whenever there is some innovation in the legal industry, it will always happen with low value services first. It will start from the border of the industry. It will start from the fringes of the industry. And if your laws are not changing to be able to allow some innovation over there, you will be, you know, I think the legal industry will be self-sabotaging its own growth. I, I don't think there's a bigger, bigger reason than regulation, which currently is stopping this. Okay, uh, I agree completely. Uh, so coming to your work, like there, there must have been many obstacles uh, faced by you while running your startup. So what were the challenges did you, you faced? Uh, would you like to share some of that? I think the main one was mindset. Moving on from being a lawyer was was an important change in mindset because I think I, I was quite full of resolve. I was looking forward very much to a new career, but I think on a, on a societal basis, like I was telling you, it tends to happen. You always tend to hear things like, Hey, what happened? Law didn't work out for you. So, yeah. you know, and, and you don't want to have a conversation with almost everybody that, Hey, no, here's my explanation. No, you don't want to do that. So, Especially relatives, relatives, parents, yeah. and uh, friends, etc. There's always if somebody starts with the assumption that something must have gone wrong, otherwise, why would somebody leave law? That I think I don't think there is a more powerful enemy that I have fought than that. Apart from that, like I told you in the first year, it was financially quite stressful. It was a new, it was it was a new life. There was a lot of uncertainty and. In the first year, especially my business wasn't a business yet. It was a, you know, I, I was a glorified freelancer in, my, in the first year of my business because I didn't have a team. I didn't hire anybody because I didn't know that there would be enough stability in the company and I would be able to pay salary six months down the line. So that one year, which was basically, I am very happy that I pulled through that first year. Because the chances were very high that I gave up and went back to taking a job. But the, 
the effects that I'm seeing today, for instance, is are the results of what happened in the first year of the business. They're not results of what happened one month ago. It's the results of what happened when I started. So I, I don't think, I think it's um, thinking too much about what other people think of you is there is there is nothing that pulls you down more than that. The more you stay on your path, what have you decided, whatever you have decided, uh, the more stronger you become. That's yep. what I've learned. Yeah. So uh, if one is interested, like many people would be after listening to the podcast, at least uh, to work in this field, that this legal tech. So can you suggest the career opportunities available for lawyers in this sector? And what advice would you give uh, to young lawyers interested in this field? Two important questions. Opportunities in this sector. I think the opportunities in this sector, what, okay, the, this sector is, is the opposite of the legal profession. Legal profession gives you one type of job. Mm-hmm. And for that job, you know, being a counsel, being an associate, being all of these, they're not, dif- they're just variations of the same job. What's a different job is a managing partner. That's a different job. It's completely different from another partner or another associate, for example. But legal tech, legal tech, or let me put it differently, the business of law side of law is very, is quite opposite because there are are a lot of different roles and you can create your own role. So for, for example, if somebody is interested in design, if somebody is a lawyer and they're interested in design and legal design is, I'm absolutely fascinated about the field. Legal design, the idea of the field is to make sure that law becomes accessible. It's designed in a manner that's usable, actionable, uh, you know, usefulness and accessibility to the law and the legal system. Let's say, I would say is one founding principle I guess one core value of legal design or one objective of legal design. Similarly, uh, let's say somebody who's very good in processes. Let's say there's an individual who are, I I know a lot of people like that from my college who were very disciplined, very, uh, everything has a system. And in the morning I do this and then I go to my classes and then I do this. Or if that's not, if something is not working in a process that starts giving me stress, then that may be that the person is more process oriented and legal process management is another very fascinating field where you are trying to take complex legal workflows or you're trying to understand how a lawyer is coming to a certain conclusion. You break that down into hundreds and thousands of pieces. And then you try and reduce first, you reduce 1000 pieces to 100 pieces. Then you bring some process, some technology, to automate 60% of those Hmm. and give the lawyer only what they need to do. So legal process, legal engineering is, is, is another field where even if you, if you don't code, I think that's fine. I think that's fine because you, you can code is logic. And if you're able to apply logic or if you're able to work with an engineering team, you will be able to find a nice sweet spot, maybe as an information designer, maybe as an information architect. Uh, but, but there are a bunch of fields. The, the book that I would recommend is by Richard Suskin. Uh, there are two books. One's called Tomorrow's Lawyers. Another one is called The Future of the Professions. He, he, lays up, he, he charts out about, uh, I think, 10 parts, 10 fields emerging within the industry, hmm. or 10 roles of a lawyer. And, uh, you know, I would, I would save the time and obviously, you know, it's, it, it's best to go back to, uh, you know, the original book. text, but I think, I think that's, that's something very, uh, I, I would also suggest working in, uh, in more fun roles, like working in, in marketing. It's, it's fun. It's, why is it fun? Because it's very close to how you live your life. If you're, if you're going out for a dinner with somebody, you, you may, you're making yourself presentable or if you're having a certain idea, like right now, I'm selling you my ideas, right? So maybe you and I are marketing ourselves, but these are more fun. And once it humanizes your, what you do for a living, 
and work becomes play then from that point on it's very easy where i struggled was i didn't know how to make my life as a lawyer play it was work to me so i used to avoid it yeah you must enjoy and, your work that's very important and that's why we both are recording this on a sunday <laughs> because yeah, we like yeah. it <laughs> most definitely most definitely it was 3 years ago uh, i used to find reasons to not do my work <laughs> today i find reasons to do my work so apart from work i don't really have a life but i'm extremely happy about it <laughs> yeah i you. don't complain yeah and also uh, i think there is also a book named end of lawyers is it by richard suskind mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah so i had <laughs> bookmarked it like <laughs> but i haven't read it any of it so for um, mm. mostly i'll read it now <laughs> at least <laughs> let's see yeah mm. Tom- tomorrow's lawyers i find is is a is a, is a really good starting point for for anybody between 20 to 35 years of age uh because if you if you start to go why did i make that characterization because if you start to think of tomorrow's lawyers is more career oriented it, it, no it, no no i'll take that back it's not career oriented but it would be useful for somebody who's trying to orient their career hmm. books for example the e myth attorney by michael gerber will be useful for people who are over 35 40 because they're trying to build a business or they're trying to build a practice so so for different age groups different orientations i think there would be there, there would be different books yeah so the last question of this episode uh, can you share your an incident uh, from your career which is very memorable to you hmm so i so th- there are a few incidents but i'm not sure how uh, you know relevant your audience might find them but i think the incidents which have the strongest memory are the are the fears when i was in college of not being able to make to the 75% attendance mark mm. uh and those have you know they have those fears have really shaped me because i would always be uh i didn't like going to classes i used to find them very pointless i thought if i slept 4 hours i think it still does more to my brain <laughs> than that but i was that not everybody may think so but i was not a fan of classes so it was those five years of you know perpetual fear that what will happen if i get a year down hmm. i mean those are incidents which are coming to my mind that you know i would i would be trying at the very last minute to maybe give a give a medical certificate one more medical certificate one more take one more and uh, <laughs> you know just a very uh, very stressful energy throughout the semester would get centered around that so i think that's uh, that's an incident which has taught me a lot because at that time i used to have problems with discipline i used to have problems with routine i used to have problems with order and today i mean it's been quite a while but i'm i'm quite the opposite of that uh yeah today yeah so a uh, great lesson Thanks for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, Namit. Thanks a lot for this wonderful conversation and sharing your experience with us. And thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you like this episode, then you must also check out our other episodes available here and follow us here so that you don't miss out a new episode. Thank you.